Welcome to China to China Institute's Pieces of China, an online series that tells the story of China one object at a time. I'm Dinda Elliott, and I'm honored to be joined today by one of the top global economic analysts, Patrick Chovanek, managing, managing director of Silvercrest Asset Management and a former professor at the Tsinghua University Business School. Today, Patrick is going to talk about a hundred year old bond that helped bring down the imperial system. So Patrick, tell us about this bond and why is it so important? So the bond is um, a 1911 um, Huquang uh, railway bond. And the backstory here is that um, back in the early 20th century, China was trying to play catch up in terms of modernization. You know, Japan had avoided being colonized uh, by rapid industrialization, it then was challenging China for dominance in Asia. Um, China was, it hadn't been colonized, but there were zones of, of influence of, of European countries in China. And so one of the ways that China was trying to catch up was to build railroads, to link the country and try to industrialize. They initially tried to do this by local subscriptions. So they basically went to you know, rich merchants and others and they bought shares in railroad companies. The problem is this really wasn't working out very well. And only 10% of the plan track had been laid and they just weren't making the kind of progress that they wanted to. So in 1911, they decided that they had to dilute the existing shareholders, recapitalize the railroads and issue bonds to foreigners, bring in foreign capital. And, um, and uh, a syndicate of American uh, and European banks, British, German, and French, um, subscribed to this issuance, which was uh, 10 million pounds, or about $40 million at the time. And it was issued, and the money came in, and they did build the railroads. The problem is that not everybody in China was very happy about being diluted. Um, and in Sichuan in particular, there were two railroad lines that this was supposed to build. The first uh, was from Wuhan, a name that's been in the news recently, um, down to Guangzhou, so that a north-south railroad line. And then another one west to Sichuan, to Chengdu. And in Chengdu, the local subscribers to the stock, uh, the original owners, were very unhappy, and they launched a protest movement called the Railroad Protection Movement. And in order to control this unrest, the government in Beijing, which was still ruled by the emperor, the Qing dynasty, they sent um, some troops from Wuhan, the new model army, which was a sort of new Western uh, unit that was set up in the center of China and Wuhan. They sent many of the troops to Sichuan West in order to suppress that. In the meantime, though, there were fewer troops in Wuhan and some revolutionary officers decided to launch a coup. And that coup succeeded, and it was the beginning of the 1911 revolution in China that overthrew the emperor and created the Republic of China. So this bond and the, the nationalism that it stoked and the protest movement that it stoked actually led through a series of events to the overthrow of the emperor of China. Wow. So did that bond, does that bond and its history still resonate and have relevance today? I mean, U.S.-China economic relations are such a low point with pressures to, uh, for, you know, the entirely decoupled economies. Are there broad lessons that can be learned from this bond and its history in terms of the power of nationalism and arguments over cross-border investment? Well, you said it right there, which is the, the real lesson, um, the broader lesson from this is, that nationalism is always an issue when it comes to uh, foreign investment. That's true in China, continues to be true in China. Um, there's still a lot of sensitivity about this period and the role that foreigners played um, in, um, in owning assets in China. Uh, and, uh, and still today, you know, there's, there's push to replace foreign investment or replace foreign products in China with domestic, uh, domestic production and domestic investment. But now, interestingly enough, the shoe is also on the other foot because 
the U.S., obviously China owns a lot of U.S. treasuries. There's concern about that. There's also concern about Chinese outbound investment, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, worries from the United States about what kind of political uh, influence comes attached to China lending money to countries all over the world, and also uh, investment in the United States. So, you know, a couple years ago, you had governors and mayors who were very eager to attract uh, Chinese investment to the United States because it meant jobs. Now there's a lot more skepticism and, and that foreign investment, that Chinese investment has fallen off because there's worries about what kind of influence that that might bring with it. Um, so these days, you know, it really affects both countries, the, the, the undercurrent of nationalism and worry about losing control of domestic assets to foreigners. Yeah, at the same time, though, it seems like, I mean, there's no question that nationalism is on the rise in both countries. But just as you suggested, it seems kind of like the tables have turned a little bit now in the sense that China is again and again talking about, at least talking about, their economy being open for business and then wanting, you know, welcoming foreign investment and all that kind of stuff while you have the sort of, um, you know, rhetoric coming out of Washington is, is really quite the opposite is kind of saying, as you said, suggesting more concern about Chinese investment. Well, well, you know, China says that just like the Qing government in 1911 wanted to welcome foreign investment for the practical benefits that it would bring, but it also had to contend with nationalism. And, you know, it's interesting because uh, there was a speech that was given recently um, by the Deputy National Security Advisor, Matt Pottinger, in which he talked about a couple of years later in 1919, there was protests in China, the May 4th movement. And he said this was an example of Chinese people calling for greater democracy, greater accountability. But one of the people who was on the webcast where he said that said, well, but wasn't it also about nationalism? Right. Now, there, was, there was a feeling that China had been uh, disrespected at the Treaty of Versailles and wasn't really being treated as an equal. And that's what led to those protests. So you know, when, when China or any other country, particularly China, you know, when it tries to bring in foreign investment or it tries to develop, it always has to contend with that issue of, of nationalism. And, you know, if, if calls for democracy are often linked with nationalism and saying that actually the, the, the government is being too accommodating of foreigners, um, by the same token, you know, in China, often calls for democracy can be pushed back against by just tying them to foreign influence and saying that this is just coming from abroad. So nationalism remains um, a key element in the dynamic of, of, you know, the Chinese discussion about the way forward. Right. And it's so interesting. You, meant, you refer to the Chinese discussion. I think we in the West so often think that it's kind of China as some kind of monolith. But in fact, you know, the government has a lot of constituencies it has to deal with. It has to deal with, you know, maybe they've themselves sort of drummed up the nationalism in the past decade or five years, whatever. But then they also have to deal with the reverberations and the ramifications of the nationalism that they've been encouraging, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's right. I mean, you know, when we say discussion, <laughs> it's not a discussion like we have here in the West, right. you know, and we, we, with elections and things like that. Yeah. It's more of an undercurrent of, you know, what what people think, uh, what common people think, what elite people in the party think about the direction forward. Right, so weirdly, this Hukwang railway bond has kind of popped into our, onto the radar screen recently again, right? So tell us what, how that's happened. Yes, so this is not just a relic from the past that's sort of an interesting basis for talking about nationalism in theory, um, because it's popped up again, as you say. Um, for a long time. So what happened to the bond? Throughout the 1920s, the Republic of China honored the bond and paid on it. Then in the 1930s, they sort of sporadically paid because there was more difficulty, civil war. Uh, and then in 1937, they just stopped paying because World War II. Um, when the communists came to power in 1949, they repudiated all foreign, all, all foreign debt of China. And they said, we're just, we're not going to pay. So for a long time, you know, you could find these in antique shops um, and pay, yeah, well, they weren't cheap. That's why I don't actually own a real one. Um, but, uh, 
But if you go on eBay now, you know, you can get a 100 pound face value, one of these for about a thousand dollars. And it's been a collector's item. However, um, some people have collected them and they would like to be paid. Uh, and in fact, during the Trump administration, uh, when it was clear that there were going to be trade tensions with China, uh, some of the bondholders, some of the larger bondholders met with President Trump and said, we would like you to present this as a demand that China actually pay these bonds. Now, <laughs> according to them, if you factor in inflation and you factor in um, interest, that the total bond issuance, which was 40 million back in 1911, is now about $1 trillion. That's what they're asking for. Um, which obviously puts a big dent in terms of, of what China owes the United States versus what the United States owes China. That's and how so it changes the nature of the trade negotiations. And so there were some in, in the Trump White House who said, yes, let's use this as a card in the, in the trade negotiations. Now, that didn't really happen. That didn't really oh, play out. Yeah. But, um, but now it's come back again with talk about reparations making China pay for coronavirus and the impact that that's had. And so there are some who say, well, you know, the Chinese owe us a trillion dollars. And so we should be able to cancel a trillion dollars of U.S. debt in order you know, to make us even. Now, we've got to be careful here, though, a little bit, because what would actually happen? Um, what would happen if they were to honor these bonds, which is you know, a whole different issue. But what would happen is the bondholders who have collected them over the years as collector's items, um, they would exchange their bonds for U.S. Treasury bonds, and then the U.S. Treasury would exchange these, the bonds, the Chinese bonds, for U.S. Treasuries that China holds. So it wouldn't actually reduce U.S. debt. It wouldn't be reparations. The people who would get paid would be the bondholders, not the United States Treasury. So when we say, you know, they owe us, well, you know, who is us? Because the idea often promoted is that this, somehow they're going to you know, reduce, we're going to eliminate some U.S. debt by doing this. Now, there's the other question, the bigger question is, you know, how do you get China to pay? Well, because China basically yeah. says, Beijing, People's Republic of China says, no, you know, we repudiated this debt back right. in 1949. We're not paying it. Much like um, when Lenin and the communists came to power in 1917 in Russia, um, they repudiated all foreign debts to the czarist bonds, and they just never paid them. Right. And, 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 you know, what's the ramification for that? Most countries do honor previous regimes debt. But, you know, if you're a communist regime, you're not looking to borrow more money. And any, people aren't going to lend you any more money. And uh, so they didn't care. Now, so much time has passed, and people have written off these debts and assume right. that they're not valid anymore, that, you know, there, there's no pressure on China in order to pay. Yeah. So um, jump in for a second just to say, I mean, firstly, I'll tell you, things just seem to get weirder and weirder every day these days. But um, I just want to clarify that this is not a super serious thing, right? It's, I mean, this it's, is not It's amazing. sort of lurking in the yeah. background. You know, okay. the Financial Times actually had an article about this okay. uh, yesterday. Okay. Really? Uh, so it's not... I think if you talk, I think to most I might people, have one right? of these things stuffed in an old closet, framed. Actually, maybe I, I'll, I could be rich. Well, you know, I mean, the other thing is, is people say, you know, Beijing says, well, if you want to collect on this, you know, go to the Republic of China because they're the ones who have been honoring it. And the Republic of China, of course, is on Taiwan. They're officially still the Republic of China, and Taiwan says, no, 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 don't look at us. You know, because all the assets were seized back in 1949 when we oh, lost the war. Yeah. And there's actually a law in Taiwan that says that they will not honor any mainland debts until reunification. Wow. And of course, I don't think that reunification, at least on Taiwan's terms, can happen anytime soon. Okay, well, these are really so, good times. But you know what? So we only have a couple more minutes. I want to end on a different note, which is to kind of bring it round to uh, today and the future. I mean... You know, we've been talking about nationalism and increasing U.S.-China tensions and decoupling and all that stuff. But, you know, with relations at such a low point, um, what do you see in the future for U.S. economic ties, U.S.-China economic ties? Is there anything, you know, is it over? Are we just going to stop doing business with each other? Is that it? Uh, no, it won't be that simple at all. Um, ties are very strained. 
you know, uh, even the bond itself illustrates how much ties have changed. Back in 19, in the early 1980s, there was a group of uh, bondholders of, of this bond who, who sued in U.S. court, uh, and the U.S. government sided with, um, with China and basically said, no, 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 we don't, we don't need this kind of thing. This, China's got sovereign immunity. You know, now you ask whether this is serious. Well, um, you know, there have been calls for the U.S. to restrict sovereign immunity to China so it could be sued in U.S. courts. Um, there have been uh, talk about this, even if it probably won't necessarily go anywhere. Uh, it doesn't really give as much leverage as some people imagine. But the fact that these sorts of things are being talked about just shows how much things have changed. And, you know, companies, I think a lot of U.S. companies, there's this illusion in, in Washington that American companies are all in China just to produce exports for the U.S. market. And so why don't we just bring them all back? But in fact, that's, that's out of date. And a lot of companies, U.S., European, others, are in China with at least the hope of selling to the Chinese market, in many cases, much more than the hope, whether it's you know, opportunity. KFC or General Motors, you know, substantial part of the revenues come from building in China for the Chinese market. And yeah. for them to just pull the plug on that would have a very, very serious impact. So, you know, the idea that we're suddenly just going to cut ties with China um, and economic ties included, I think is highly unrealistic. However, you know, companies have to realize that they're entering a very, uh, you know, uncharted territory when it comes to the kind of um, hostility and sniping that has started and may deepen between the United States and China. Right. Patrick, as usual, you are just so brilliant. I am so sorry that we have to, our time has, time is up, so we have to stop. But um, I really promise everyone in the audience that we're going to try to bring Patrick Chavonic back in longer form to talk in greater depth about the Chinese economy and ho hopefully next time in person. Um, whether anybody actually collected on those. All right, we'll find out, right. And in the meantime, you can catch all of our Pieces of China episodes on YouTube, so please check them out. I want to encourage you all to please, please become members of China Institute. You get great discounts, and more importantly, it allows us to bring brilliant speakers like Patrick Chavanek to our broad array of programs. Um, please join us next week for a top travel specialist, Zhang Mei, who's going to talk about her childhood memories of the bi minorities poetic use of the magnolia blossom and how modernization has changed her home province of Yunnan. And the week after that, we will have Kevin Kwan, the author of Crazy Rich Asians, talking about the haute couture dress that defines a new generation of rich Chinese. Um, Patrick, I want to thank you so much for helping us tell the story. Thank you. Thank you for being with us.